Welcome to Music History Monday for February 6th, 2023. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Johannes Ockeghem and the Oltre Montani. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the death on February 6, 1497, 526 years ago today, of the composer and singer Johannes Ockeghem in Tours, France, at the age of 87 or so. He was born circa 1410 in the French-speaking city of saint Ghislain in what today is Belgium, about five miles from the border with France. The title of this post, Johannes Ockingham and the Ultramontani, employs an Italian word that may not be familiar to everybody, Oltre Montani. Again, it's an Italian word, a word that means literally those from the other side of the mountains. The mountains in question are the Alps. So in fact, generally, the word refers to people from the other side of the Alps, from northern and northwestern Europe. But when used in the 15th and 16th centuries, it meant something quite more specific than that. It referred to musicians from what today are northern France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Johannes Ockeghem was just such an Ultramontano, having been born in Belgium close to the northern border of France. Johannes Ockeghem, circa 1410 to 1497. Born circa 1410, died 1497. Yeah, back in the 15th century, if someone became famous, and at the time of his death, Johannes Ockeghem was famous across Europe, their death date was and remains common knowledge. But for people born in the 15th century and earlier, birth dates and early accounts of their lives before they became famous, well, that's a different matter entirely. Generally speaking, we know next to nothing about the birth dates and early lives of ordinary people born in the 15th century and before, and that includes Johannes Ockeghem. In fact, we're not even sure how he spelled his name. We use O-C-K-E-G-H-E-M, Ockeghem, today, because that spelling came from a document, now lost, in which he supposedly signed his name using that spelling. But other spellings of his name include O-G-K-E-G-U-M, Ockeghem, O-K-C-H-E-M, Ockchem, H-O-C-Q-U-E-G-A-M, Hockegam, and Hockegham, H-A-M. Okay, here's some stuff that we do know. Johannes Hockegam was considered by his contemporaries, as he is considered today, to be, along with Guillaume Dufay, circa 1397 to 1474, Antoine Basnois, circa 1430 to 1492, and Josquin Desprez, circa 1450 to 1521, the greatest and most influential composer of the 15th century. Now, for those of us who may not be familiar with the names of the Oltre Montani, Archegem, Dufay, Boussinois, and Desprez, I would be so bold as to suggest that they were equivalent in their time to the Vienna-based quartet of Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, and Schubert. In terms of these Renaissance composers' talent and impact on the history of Western music, I am not exaggerating. For reasons already explained, we know nothing about Ockeghem's early life. Like most composers of his time, he almost certainly started his musical life as a church chorister, likely in the city of Mons, a few miles east of his hometown of saint Ghislain. The first documentary mention of Ockeghem's activity as a musician date to June 1443, 
when he is listed as being among the chanteurs, the singers, at the Church of Our Lady in Antwerp. His initial fame was, indeed, as a singer. He was a basso and was reputed to have a rich, flexible, and unerringly accurate voice. He was described by the people that knew him, including the famed humanist Erasmus, as being, quote, exceptionally engaging, honest, virtuous, kind, generous, charitable, and pious, unquote. Ockingham's friend, the cleric Francesco Florio, 1428 to 1484, described him this way in the 1470s, quote, I am sure you could not dislike this man. So pleasing is the beauty of his person, so noteworthy the sobriety of his speech and of his morals and his graciousness. He alone, of all the singers, is free from vice and abounding in all virtues, unquote. Okay, combine a brilliant singer and composer with physical beauty, a great attitude, and a long life, and you have the prescription for success, and Ockingham was nothing if not successful. By 1452, the now approximately 42-year-old Johannes Ockingham had moved to Paris, where he served as music director of the court of the French kings, Charles VII and Louis XI. He held posts at Notre Dame Cathedral and was so respected by the kings he served that he led diplomatic missions to Spain. Sadly, much of Ockingham's music has been lost. The number of surviving works that can reliably be attributed to him is fairly small. Some 14 masses, including a requiem, five motets, these are sacred polyphonic works set in Latin, and 21 chansons, these are secular polyphonic works set in French. Because we must, let's hear some of Ockingham's music. His chanson, Four Suleman, for four voices, has been linked to this podcast. It is a beautiful and achingly melancholy work. Here's the first of its seven stanzas. Save only the expectation that I shall die, no hope remains in my weary heart. For my misery torments me so bitterly that there is no pain I do not feel for you, for I am quite certain to lose you. The Franco-Flemish School Once more with feeling, Johannes Ockingham was born in the French-speaking Belgian city of saint Ghislain, about five miles from the border with France. In the literature, Ockingham is inevitably identified as being Franco-Flemish, meaning in modern geographical terms as being from northern France, southern Belgium. However, when applied to the music of the Renaissance, the phrase Franco-Flemish refers broadly to the music of the Low Countries, of northern France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. The latter three, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, are often referred to today as the Benelux countries, an acronym consisting of the first syllable of each country's name. For roughly 150 years, from about 1410 to 1560, Franco-Flemish composers, musical establishments, and choir schools, which were music conservatories attached to cathedrals and collegiate churches, dominated the European scene. How such a small geographical area came to dominate for no small period of time, the European musical scene was, as is so often the case, a function of politics, money, education, and cultural priorities. The Duchy of Burgundy. In the late 14th century, the French crown, which controlled much of the area just described, named it the Duchy of Burgundy, and made it a semi-autonomous region. By the mid-15th century, it included the county of Burgundy and Lorraine in northeastern France, Hainaut, Brabant, 
and Flanders in what today is Belgium, Gelderland, Holland, and Friesland in what today is the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. To list the major cities of the Duchy of Burgundy in the 15th century is to name some of the wealthiest and most sophisticated communities in all of Europe. It included such big-time commercial, banking, and manufacturing centers as Amsterdam, Utrecht, Brussels, Bruges, Arras, Mons, Lille, Ghent, Antwerp, Liege, Amiens, Nancy, Cambrai, Luxembourg City, and Dijon, cities that stood at the very cutting edge of what was then the new European capitalism and culture. A series of powerful dukes ruled Burgundy, whose nicknames read something like a mafioso roll call. Philip the Bold, who reigned from 1392 to 1404. John the Fearless, who reigned from 1404 to 1419. Philip the Good, who reigned from 1414 to 1497. And Charles the Bold, who reigned from 1467 to 1477. Sadly, no Wilhelm the Weasel. After Charles the Bold's death in battle in 1477, Burgundy ceased being an independent entity and was reabsorbed into the Kingdom of France. It was Philip the Good, Le Bon, who brought Burgundy to the height of its political power, wealth, and artistic prestige. He was a lavish patron of the arts, and his court at Dijon came to be regarded as the hippest and most splendid in all of Europe, far outpacing the French court in Paris with its magnificence. To this day, in both Belgium and the Netherlands, the phrase, quote, a Burgundian lifestyle, unquote, means to enjoy one's life to the fullest with good food, wine, and extravagant entertainment. Apropos of nothing beyond historical interest, it was Philip the Bold's Burgundian troops who captured Joan of Arc on May 23, 1430. Business before blood. The Burgundians sold Joan, French patriot though she was, to the English for a sizable ransom. She was tried and convicted of heresy by a kangaroo court and burned at the stake in Rouen, the seat of the English occupation government, on May 30th, 1431, after which her ashes were thrown into the River Seine. To the point, patronage of the arts was such in Burgundian lands that the best schools of music in all of Europe could be found there during the 15th and 16th centuries. The short list of important Franco-Flemish slash Burgundian composers of the Renaissance is also the short list of the most important composers of the Renaissance until about 1560. That list includes Guillaume Dufay, who was born in or near Cambrai in France around 1397 and died in Cambrai in 1474. Our Johannes Ockeghem, who was born in Belgium and died in 1497 in Tours, France. Jacob Obrecht, who was born in Ghent, Belgium, around 1457 and died of plague in the Italian city of Ferrara in 1505. Heinrich Isaac, who was most likely born in Flanders around 1450 and died in Florence in 1517. Josquin de Pre, who was born in northern France circa 1450 and died in condé sur la scaux in northern France in 1521. Adrien Willert, probably born in Bruges, Belgium, around 1490, and died in Venice in 1562, and Orlando de Lassus, who was born circa 1532 in Mons, Belgium, and died in 1594 in Munich. Now, of this short list, only Guillaume Dufay and Josquin de Pre died on relatively home turf though both had been members of the papal choir in Rome and consequently each spent a major portion of his career in Italy. Ockeghem died in France, Isaac and Willout 
died in Italy, and Delassus in Bavaria, today southern Germany. Now this tells us something important. Having been educated in the Netherlands, as the Franco-Flemish Burgundian region was generally referred to at the time, these composers spent the bulk of their careers elsewhere, particularly on the Italian peninsula, where the Roman-based universal or Catholic church and the ruling councils and oligarchies of cities like Venice, Verona, Bologna, Milan, Ferrara, Siena, and Florence vied with each other for the best talent. Italy was the world headquarters of the Renaissance, and the wealth of its cities, together with the Italian proclivity to cultivate fine art, created a mother load of job opportunities for Burgundian musicians. Musicians who were only too happy to pass their lives in Italy, as many of us would be happy to do so today, starting with yours truly. None of this is new. Top talent is always in top demand, and that talent will usually migrate to where the bucks are the most beaucoup. In the 15th century, outside of the ducal court at Burgundy and the French court in Paris, that meant the Italian peninsula. The Italians called their Franco-Flemish slash Burgundian musicians the Oltremontani, the ones from the other side of the mountains, from the other side of the Alps. The Oltremontani dominated Italian music until the mid-16th century, at which point native Italian composers began to replace their Burgundian masters as the leading composers of Europe. A little respect, please. In the decades that followed the ascent of Italian composers during the mid-17th century, certain elements of the Italian musical community were not particularly kind to the memory of their Franco-Flemish brethren. Those same Franco-Flemish composers who had been so indispensable in the creation of Italian music institutions. As an example of that lack of historical respect, we would invoke a plaque placed on a palazzo in Florence. That palazzo belonged to Count Giovanni de Bardi, 1534-1612, who hosted the first iteration of the so-called Florentine Camerata, a private think tank made up of musicians, poets, aestheticians, and historians, who together invented opera. The invention of opera was posited on a single article of musical and expressive faith, that only a single accompanied melody sung by a single person could transmit to a listener the emotions behind the words being sung. The plaque on Bardi's Palazzo reads in part, quote, In this house of Bardi lived Giovanni, Count of Vernio. He cultivated poetry and music and brought together and was the driving spirit behind the celebrated Camerata, which aimed to restore that musical art that had been barbarized by Flemish peculiarities." Unquote. The Flemish peculiarities slash barbarities, so unkindly referred to on the plaque, were the polyphonic writing, meaning the simultaneous presence of multiple principal melodies, and group singing characteristic of Franco-Flemish music. To our Italian amici, a little more respect for the Oltremontani would be appropriate. Thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com. Dot com.